Okay, it's time. So with it being 7 p.m., let's go ahead and get started. On behalf of our sponsors, the Clearwater Neighborhood Coalition, the City of Clearwater, and the Suncoast Sierra Club, we welcome you to the third Building Better Neighborhoods Conference. I am your moderator, Sheridan Boyle, the City of Clearwater Sustainability Coordinator. We love our city and the purpose of this series of webinars is to support sustainable neighborhoods and improve the quality of life for our residents. Our topic this year is building better neighborhoods through home gardening and Florida friendly landscaping. This topic is especially timely now due to our COVID-19 confinement. We know that many of you are considering ways to relieve stress and to make staying at home creative and productive. Gardening is a great way to do just that. We invite you now to sit back and listen to our expert. This webinar, last in a series of four, is being recorded and will be, be available at the City of Clearwater's website. To get there on the web, go to myclearwater.com slash BBN, and I will repeat this at the end of the conference. A few housekeeping reminders before we begin. You are all on attendee mode, which means you can't share your video or unmute yourselves. This is done to make sure today's webinar goes as smoothly as possible. However, we would love to answer your questions and have saved 10 minutes at the end of tonight's session to address them. Oop, I didn't have my slide there, but anyhow, to get to the Q&A uh, box, uh, make sure at the bottom of your screen, you can see a box that's labeled Q&A, and to submit a question, please type it into that box that's labeled Q&A. You will notice that you also have a chat feature, which you can, you can use to express a thought, However, we will only be pulling questions from the Q&A box specifically, so make sure that's where you put your questions. After typing your question, be sure to hit the enter button to officially submit it. Tonight's topic, titled An Introduction to Florida-Friendly Landscaping, is all about how you can protect our precious resources, save money, and have an attractive low-maintenance yard. We are thrilled to be led in this discussion by Doris Tyson. Doris is the Florida Friendly uh, Program Manager at UF IFAS Pinellas County Extension. The Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a University of Florida IFAS Extension Outreach Program that teaches homeowners how to design and maintain their landscape using principles that are Florida friendly. As part of this outreach, Doris goes out into community associations to educate their members on how to change landscape practices and design concepts to protect the areas water resources while still creating and maintaining attractive and desirable landscapes. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening, Doris. And with that, I will turn it over to you for your awesome presentation. Thank you, Sheridan, and thank you for having me. And um, welcome everybody at this lovely evening. It was a great day here. So, um, and it fits right into um, this is a perfect time for gardening. So I'm glad to be here and glad to talk about my favorite topic, Florida Friendly Landscaping. And with that, um, let's get started. Do you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, we can see it. I don't know. You're not exactly in presentation mode. Okay, let's it's see here from the beginning. There we go. That might be it. All right. Perfect. Okay. Good evening again. So just a short uh, uh, introduction to our partners here. Uh, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a program of the University of Florida, IFAS Extension out of Gainesville. And our partners are Tampa Bay Water, which is the wholesale water supplier of the region. And they are kind enough to fund six programs in the Tampa Bay region the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program I'm talking about, and then of course, Pinellas County. And with that, we are talking about, as Sheridan already said, introduction to Florida Friendly Landscaping. So what is a Florida Friendly Landscape or yard? A Florida Friendly Yard is created by incorporating and practicing the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping, also FFL into the creation and also of the management of your landscape. And you will see it is a concept. The goal of a Florida friendly yard is it's attractive functional low maintenance with the result of saving water and energy, reducing pollutants, providing habitat, and it recycles. So 
it's a concept. The nine principles are interrelated. And when you look at these nine principles, you see the right plant, right place, which is the most important principle. If you put a right plant in the right location, you're off to a successful start. I would also group the providing for wildlife into that design concept. It's also a little bit of maintaining or managing your yard, but providing for wildlife should be part of your design. And the other uh, seven that you see below there, if you go through all of them step by step, they really have to do how you manage your landscape. And again, they are all interrelated. Principle number one, right plant, right place. As I said, it's the most important principle. And I show you some examples of wrong plants in the wrong places. So you see that a lot, palms on the left-hand side being too close to the eaves. So it's rubbing against that eave. It's not good for the palm, not good for the house. Then you do have on the right upper side, you do have, that's a tricky one here. That would be the turf, the improper planting here because you don't make, it's not purposeful. You cannot use it. Um, the lawnmower, it doesn't fit in there. A weed whacker would damage the lattice and the wall. So the paint would be damaged. So the, the owner would not be happy if you provide, if you provide that service, it would be lots of upkeep after the fact. And then you do have the two bottom pictures there, which is the variegated arboricola, very common plant in the landscape. And you see how tall it would like to be, five to six feet tall and wide. And then under this water fountain, they planted two of these guys. So where would they go, right? So this is self-explanatory. These are all examples of wrong plants in the wrong location. Let me show you these here. This is about sun and shade. So we have a holly fern here, which is in too much sun and also not very good soil probably. So what you see here is the wrong plant in the wrong location regarding light conditions. Then on the right hand side, you have the same plant in dappled sunshade here and see how healthy it, healthy it is. This is the right plant in the right location. So you see just how healthy a plant looks like that you really have um, a poor selection on the left hand side and a good selection on the right hand side. I also like to mention turf grass as of right plant, right place. And we don't see it as a plant per se, the turf grass, but as a whole, it's a plant planting feature in the landscape that's very, very often overused and used in the wrong locations. On the left hand side, this is Bahia grass. The good news is it's very drought tolerant and doesn't really need a lot of fertilizer. However, I would debate if this would be the right plant in the right location in a 55 and older community where they don't really make use of that turf. Instead, they could have created a bit more diversity putting in some more trees and plants to um, provide something for wildlife, to make it more attractive and more diverse. Then you have the picture with a little strip there next to the parking lot. That is the wrong plant for that location as well, because how do you water this? How do you get the fertilizer there without spilling into the curb and running into the stormwater system? Then you have the right-hand side picture. You can see the grass is going into a decline. And turf under trees does not really work well. There is competition with roots and nutrients and water and all that good stuff. And you do see on the bottom right below it that this is how it will look like in the future. The, the trees will win the battle of being the dominant plant there. And it's good that way because you need more trees than turf grass. And then on the very bottom picture there, you see that the grass being planted between these trees very difficult to maintain. You have to go back and forth with that lawnmower and have to pay good attention that you don't damage the tree trunks. And then the slope on the other side of that um, walkway there, you can see how would you mow that with a mower? Maybe a weed backer? Maybe, I don't know. It's just both sides of that wouldn't be good, good choices for turf grass. There are other solutions. So, Right place with a question mark and wrong place, definitely under trees. So turf grass, purposeful turf grass where it's needed and where it is in the right location as well. So we want to assess the site characteristics first before we can determine which is the right plant in the right lo location. So if you do a proper site assessment and you do um, incorporate that in the design and the plant selection for a specific site, 
that will reduce the use of water, fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, and last but least, labor. You want to look into type of soils. So what kind of soils do we have mostly here? Sandy soils in most of our county here. But you want to have a look in East Lake Woodlands. They might have a little different situation backing up to the preserve there. So you want to check out your soils. Light, do you have sun or shade? Drainage, do you have standing water after a rain event? Do you have a really, really extremely dry site? So you want to look at um, what is the drainage situation and how dry is your yard? Structure and obstacles that you need to pay attention to. It could be in the ground, it could be above ground, it could be a power line, it could be existing trees, an existing building. Maybe something like um, taking into consideration the eaves, if you want to do any foundation plantings. Existing vegetation, anything that's old, that is not any, it's out of its lifespan. So you might want to think about removing plants that don't longer have a purpose. Maybe you have invasive plants in the landscape, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And what problems are you trying to solve? Do you have an issue that you always wanted to address? You cannot address everything with plants only. You might have to look into using some hardscape materials. Anything that's not plant material is considered hardscape, such as pavers. Um, if you use crushed shells for a walkway, something like this, uh, anything that would be considered hardscape would go in first. And this is something that I talk about at, in my design classes, but maybe a problem that you want to solve that you finally can tackle. So then you want to talk about or look into the plant characteristics and needs. So you want to match your site condition with the plant characteristics and needs. First of all, and you saw, remember the picture from the water fountain, you want to know what's the mature size, how tall and high does it want to grow? Does it like sun or shade? Or maybe a combination like the holly fern, it takes maybe a little bit of sun, but not full afternoon sun. So sun or shade or something in between. Does it prefer wet or dry soils? Salt tolerance? Do you live close to the coast? Do you have well water that's maybe intruded by salt water that you are still using? Anything like this, reclaimed water that contains salts. So salt tolerance, if you do have a situation, you need to look into that. You've got to pick plants that can accept that. Is it susceptible to pests and diseases? If you know plants that already have a, have a known problem like psychic scale, which is really a widespread um, problem that there's no cure for, and you don't want to get yourself into high maintenance, um, maybe you want to refrain from using these plants, on selecting these plants. Let's talk about native plants. Native plants are highly desired because they have so many good features. They're adapted to local soil conditions. They are also adapted to our local climate. If it's rain, if it's wind, if it's cold, if it's whatever it is, wet, they're adapted to our local uh, climate conditions. So they are also preferred by native wildlife. And then you are recreating wildlife habitat using native plants. Now here a word again to Right plant, right place. The same concept applies to native plants. If you put a native plant in the wrong location, it also will not be thriving and you won't have success with it. A few examples here of native plants. Uh, here are some ground covers, the blue porter weed. This is a really nice ground cover that uh, is very well behaved. It grows in these little mounds. If you space them maybe two feet apart, they will just touch each other, but you have a really nice ground cover. It's a butterfly attractor. It, the flowers open in the morning and they close in the afternoon. So they don't bloom in the afternoon or late afternoon when you come home. But besides that, it's a fabulous plant. Sunshine Mimosa, another uh, sun loving ground cover. It's a sensitive plant also called because when you touch the leaves, they fold up. It can be a turf substitute. And I show you a picture. This is how it could look like if you just plant the whole front yard with just sunshine mimosa. And it's basically maintenance free. You don't fertilize, you don't, you can mow if you like, if you want to keep it a little lower, but there's actually no need for that. Uh, two more, firebush. Here is a really nice large growing shrub. 
butterfly and hummingbird attractor again. It loves, it's loved by bees as well. You see one crawling around in that flower there. So also our pollinators are really appreciative of that plant. And then the berries in the, this time of the year, um, my mockingbirds here in my backyard, they all go all nuts about the berries on firebush. Um, and the squirrels have no chance to get to the berries. That's the good news. So it's really for the birds. Then the flowers are stunning. Most of the year they have the flowers, most time of the year. And then you can use it in full sun or partial. Then sea grape, that's another really very popular plant. You see mostly or very often trimmed to a hedge, which is unfortunate because you really miss out on that nice tropical look and that kind of sprawling character. If you don't prune it or if you're pruning accordingly, you can have a really nice tree, make a nice tree out of it. So I, my first sea grape tree that I saw, I almost didn't recognize because it, because it was so huge. And I just thought, I never saw it in a tree, a tree like this, 30 feet tall. So it was amazing. Great for unique tropical look. The fruit are edible, the grapes. Um, you can make jelly out of them. It can be a little messy because the leaves don't decompose easily. They're kind of hard, but if you have a self-mulching area, that's okay. It doesn't really matter. So let's talk about invasive exotic plants. Invasive exotic plants are what you find in our environment, such as Brazilian pepper. That's the most common invasive plant in our landscape. Lantana camara on the top left uh, side there, that picture. We have air potato in the center. We do have carrot wood below, and we do have the Mexican petunia on the right-hand side. All these plants invade our natural areas and they can displace our native vegetation and they can also at the same time displace our native wildlife. So if you do have any invasive plants in your landscape, you are encouraged to remove them. Even if you think like the Mexican petunia, it's such a beautiful, colorful plant, it is really bad news. It's not a good idea to keep this plant. The others um, distribute, lots of these plants distribute by seeds and are carried by birds and um, other wildlife to other areas. So this time of the year, when you do see the berries on the plant, don't remove it now because removing it would mean you are, you are probably distributing the berries yourself throughout your property, wherever you have to, to drag them or to carry them, these plants by removal, after removal. Okay, let's talk about principle number two, water efficiently. And I'm not sure I usually would ask the question who of the participants do have an irrigation system, but I'm going through this because this is a very important topic. And uh, I didn't mention that before, but the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a program that is really here to educate uh, communities and homeowners alike and professionals on protecting our water resources. So this whole concept that I'm talking about today here is about protecting water resources. And this is why I have quite some slides on water efficiently. So the facts on water is that up to 50, it's about actually up now, it's 55 to 60% of total household use is used outdoors for irrigation. And if you see what you can do with this water, uh, especially if you put it on a non-food crop like turf, that water would be covering for, for 2,500, which is an average lawn, for 2,500 square foot lawn would cover the domestic water needs for about 10 people. So think along, this line, along these lines, if you use water on your landscape to use it wisely. So when we look at the water that's available, readily available on earth, it's 2% is kept in polar ice, 97% is salt water, that leaves us with 1% for all other purposes. This 1% includes all of this, sources of irrigation water, all of that, potable uh, municipal utility, well, private or community wells, lakes, ponds, reclaimed rain collection containers. So all these sources that you see here are part of the 1% readily available fresh drinking water. So let's talk about water efficiency. Water is wasted due to improper calibration, excessive frequency, turf or plant interference, broken sprinkler heads, misdirected sprinkler heads, and clogged nozzles. So what you see here is 
if you have a sprinkler head facing a fence and it sprays on the gravel, that doesn't do anything. So that needs adjustment. The others as well, if you have a geyser shooting up, that should be repaired pretty quickly. And then if, if the wind drift or something like this, what you see on the right hand side, waters your street, that doesn't do anything either. So landscape irrigation needs to be maintained. So here are some tips reducing frequency of irrigation in winter and we are getting out of the dormancy season, but we are still in there. So up to mid March, depending a little bit on temperature and the weather, every 10 to 14 days is sufficient to water. We did have many, lots of rain this winter. I mean, at least I had in St. Petersburg where I live. So um, keep in mind that you can really reduce your irrigation by just turning it off. When we have rain, three quarters of an inch or to an inch, then you are good, turn it off. So skip a week is 10 to, 10 to 14 days in the winter. I mean, it's, it's when plants are dormant and don't need all this water. Let your plants tell you when they need water. If you see a footstep not coming back up when you step on the grass and if the grass blades fold, that's another good indicator. Design and maintain a yard that thrives mostly on rainfall once it's established. That's a very good way to, to, um, to do this. On the right hand side, the picture I took that in my neighborhood while I was walking, it was really raining, I mean, heavily. I was there with the umbrella, took my evening walk and here we go. Not even, um, not only that was it irrigating there, there was this broken sprinkler head. It really annoys me when I see this. It's just so wasteful, it's just awful. So I took a picture, I had to. All right, so also got to adhere to the local watering restrictions and recommendations. And I would ask you the question now, usually, how often are we allowed to water right now? We are allowed twice a week in Pinellas County. There are some exceptions, the city of Tarpon Springs and Bel Air, they'd only allow once a week watering throughout the year. However, you don't need to use these twice a week watering says It's available to us, but we don't have to do water twice a week. So keep that in mind. Water in early morning hours, that minimizes water loss due to wind drift and evaporation. And you want to irrigate deeply, as I said before, three quarters to an inch to encourage drought resistance in a deep root system of your landscape plants. You want to maintain mulch. I'll talk about that in a minute. Use rain barrels to collect rainwater. Maybe some rain barrels. Maybe you want to step it up and um, want to look into a cistern or maybe um, some bigger device. Use a rain gauge. Measure the rain. I measured uh, 2.5 inches uh, over the, what, the last week and the weekend before, and then another 1.3 inches. I'm good. I mean, I'm not watering anything and my plants don't grow right now so a lot. So. Measuring the rain really helps to know how much water did my, did my landscape receive. Install a soil moisture sensor or rain sensor. You see the pictures on the right hand side there. This is a soil moisture sensor on the bottom and a rain sensor on the right hand side. It's required by law to have that if you do have an operating functioning automatic irrigation system. Since 2009, we got to have these devices on our systems. When designing a landscape, grow plants according to their water needs and water accordingly. So don't have a cactus growing within azaleas that have totally different watering requirements because you probably want to please the azalea and the poor cactus gets overwatered. Let's talk about mulch. You want to maintain two to three inches, a layer of organic mulch. It will, will help retain soil moisture, reduce erosion, and suppresses competitive weeds and also it moderates the soil temperature when it gets too hot, when it gets too cold and plants like moderation in soil temperature. There are some examples what uh, mulches could uh, work for you. The only one that we don't recommend is cypress mulch because it could be uh, harvested unsustainably from wetlands. We need the cypress trees to be in the wetlands to help recharge our aquifer, filter our water, so these are really beneficial trees that should not be chopped up to mulch. And um, it's, it's not a byproduct of the lumber industry anymore. So they're really harvesting cypress trees to make mulch out of them, which is not sustainable. Then eucalyptus, pine bark, pine straw, melaleuca mulch is a really good uh, mulch. Uh, chip pellets, 
uh, scrap lumber. If you don't know where it's coming from, what's in that uh, in that mulch, I don't recommend that, or we don't recommend that because you don't know what's what could be in there as of being harmful. And then recycled yard waste, that's free. And it also produces uh, soil much more quicker than these hard woody mulches. Oak leaves, they are free. This time of the year, the oak leaves are falling and people are bagging them up. I'm going to around the neighborhoods and say, I talk to the homeowners if they're outdoors and I say, don't you want your oak leaves to have for mulch for your landscape? Say, nope, don't like them. And I pick them up and use them. I pick up about 20, 30 bags and then I use them throughout the year to put them in my landscape. They break down nicely and provide great soil over, the, over time. And I keep doing that. Every year I, I load more mulch into my landscape and I more load, use mulch that breaks down quickly for good soil. The principle number four is recycling. So when we talk about recycling in a Florida friendly landscape, we talk about grass clippings that remain on the ground, leaves and yard trimmings that, that all can be recycled on site to provide added nutrients to the soil and to reduce waste disposal. Compost, that's another way of recycling. It improves soil tilth and structure. It increases water and nutrient holding ability. It can save you money by using less fertilizer and water. And it helps return organic materials to the soil and it keeps, again, keeps them out of landfills and water. And at last, supports living organisms. That's fantastic because we need them. We need these little critters in our landscapes. I want to say to um, uh, compost, we are teaching a compost class um, March 20th. It's a Saturday. So if you're interested, please join us. I'm just going very quickly through the principles so I cannot get into the detail. The only thing that I want to mention here is what can be composted. Anything that was once a plant. It's a very, very basic rule and there are other, all kinds of uh, composting um, methods. One is vermicomposting, where you should not be using uh, citrus, but for regular compost, that's easy to remember. Anything that was once a plant can go into your compost. Principle number five, use fertilizers appropriately. First of all, less is often best. You can maintain a landscape, a yard without any fertilizer. If you use the right plant at the right location and the plant is happy, you don't need fertilizer. You really don't need to be on a regular fertilizer regime, regime, regimen to um, think your plants need that to, to, to grow happily. Um, too much fertilizers can be detrimental to your yard and the environment. They can negatively impact the environment and our waters. Only fertilize when plants are deficient. Or if you want to have, let's say you have a food crop, you have fruit trees and you want to maybe um, help the fruit or the, the tree to um, produce more fruit. Um, yes, then you might want to look into that. Vegetables, yes, you might want to use vegetable, uh, uh, fertilizer on your vegetables. So th there's all exceptions. I'm talking about an ornamental landscape here. Only fertilize as needed. And also don't fertilize during drought. So just a few tips here. As I said before, fertilize only as needed to maintain the health of lawns and landscape plants. Use a slow release fertilizer, 50% or more nitrogen and slow release forms. You want to adhere to local fertilizer ordinance because uh, this is in the making for ooh, about 10 years now that we cannot use any fertilizers containing nitrogen in Pinellas County between June 1st and September 30th. You should not be able to find it in the big box stores or in nurseries that should be pulled off the shelves. In addition, in Pinellas County, we cannot use fertilizers containing phosphorus year round. Phosphorus is in the soil plentiful, so we don't need to add that to the soil, to our landscape because it would be running off and would contribute to pollution. If you can prove with a soil test that you do, that your, that your soil is lacking phosphorus, yes, you can buy it with that proof. You can buy it and apply it to your landscape. When you reduce, when you use reclaimed water, you want to reduce fertilization because reclaimed water contains nutrients. So anytime you use reclaimed water on your landscape, you put a little bit of fertilizer, so to speak, liquid fertilizer on your landscape. 
And then last, always read the label before applying. If you buy a 50 pound bag, don't think you need to use it up. If you only need a little bit of it, you wanna always make sure you always go by the label and you wanna know how much do I need for that area that I'm gonna, um, that I wanna fertilize. Principle number six, providing for wildlife. That's one of my favorites. So what does wildlife need to thrive? It needs food, water, and shelter. And that applies to any area. It's not Florida specific, but we talk about, of course, Florida's diverse wildlife. We have a diverse wildlife. We have a, such a, a treasure of wildlife here in Florida. So cherish it and help it along. And the reason I'm saying this is we really have so much habitat loss, especially in Pinellas County here. When you look at, we are so urban and we are so paved over. We are so, um, yeah, um, divided. We have so many developments in here that um, wildlife struggles. It needs to find what it needs to find in our yards. So supporting and creating ecosystems, that's another really good reason to help wildlife along. Um, food source for wildlife, this is what you want to look for to provide and um, selecting plants accordingly that provide that, maybe berries, maybe acorns, maybe something like um, uh, nectar for pollinators. Then protective cover for small fish. If you have a backyard pond, that would be helpful to protect fish. Source of nesting material for birds and small mammals. And I'm not going into detail here. There are some people having favorite wildlife mammals. Some like squirrels, some don't, some feed them, which you shouldn't. So wildlife should find everything it needs in the landscape and there are exceptions to the rule for some birds. But usually what I say is that, what we say, if you have a yard and you have a good balanced um, diet for them ready in your landscape with plants, um, you should not really additionally needing to feed them. And then you create, of course, shade for humans and wildlife through trees. So that's something that you want to create if you have room. And it doesn't need to be a huge tree. It could be a medium sized or a small tree. Then, as I said before, nectar for small insects, pollinators, and butterflies. And I just I wanna, don't want to read this whole section here to you. I just want to um, let you know that there have several studies have been um, made, and one of them was about insects, another one was made about birds. And um, you really want to uh, want to be aware that um, we have a sh sharp decline in insects, which affects negatively our ecosystems. They are part of the food web and they have their role to play in our lives. So um, you want to really um, make sure that you help along with something to provide. And one of the researches that have been done um, in Germany was that um, between 89, 1989 and 2016, an overall decline of nearly 77% of insects was observed. So this is dire. So we really want to um, think about this. And if you think my small yard cannot make a difference, yes, you can, because if you all do a little bit, we are creating these wildlife corridors where the birds and wildlife can travel through. And I'm talking migrating birds as well as, as um, native birds, then we can contribute. And this is the spiel about birds, which is pretty sad too. Uh, this was a study done in North America. Nearly 3 billion birds are gone since 1970. So um, yeah, again, the major reason for bird species decline is the loss of habitat and their food sources. So anything you can do to put back what was taken out, that really would be beneficial. The next principle is reduce stormwater runoff. And that has to do again with uh, water. So anything that you can keep on your landscape, anything that would be soil, that would be fertilizer, pesticides, debris, mulch, leaves, anything, Anything that you can keep on site as much as you can, the less will run off from your landscape into the stormwater system and, large, and lately then into the Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. So anything that you can keep on site that much, as much as you can and think about some strategies that would be beneficial. So 
going down the drain are water quality concerns because we can either have runoff and leaching of fertilizers of pesticides that can contaminate groundwater and surface water sources. So um, I think I go back here once because I want to look at this here quickly with you. Um, what you can do in your home landscape is um, you can use a rain barrel or as I said before, maybe more than one. You can use cisterns, you can use something that collects rainwater before it runs off and can use it. That's even the, that's the beauty of it. On the left hand side, this is a rain garden. We just taught a class last Saturday on rain gardens because this is an underutilized landscape feature that really benefits um, reducing stormwater runoff. What this little um, depression in the ground does is with the plants being planted there, they help filter what's running into that, into that little depression. It could be car oils from the street, it could be fertilizers from the landscape, it could be again pesticides, herbicides, and it collects in that little, in this little depression and the plants help filter. It also is a great feature, it looks pretty, and it might solve some problems that you have in the landscape maybe with um, not permanently standing water, not a permanent pool, but maybe some water that, st that stands there that collects after a rain event for a little bit. Okay, so I want to talk about non-point source pollution and point source pollution. And you might have heard that uh, these, these um, before. The non-point source pollution, these are our yards. We cannot point our fingers on where this is coming from, the pollution. And you look at this downspout that's draining onto the, onto the driveway there, and that takes everything along with it. Everything that's on this driveway is going down the drain into the stormwater system, as I said before, into the next body of water, maybe a retention pond, maybe the intracoastal, and then the Gulf eventually. So that is something we can control. We cannot point our fingers. We are, as a big group, we are in, in charge. We are responsible for making this better. The downspout could be redirected into the landscape. Let the landscape have the water, not the dry fay. And then we talk about point source pollution. We can point our finger to it. Where is it coming from? It could be a factory. It could be a farm. We can point our finger to it. We can say, this is where this factory disposes of this water. You can see the bottom picture, the nasty looking picture, and you can point your finger. This is where the water is coming from. This would be called point source pollution. So when we talk about landscapes, you will hear, hear, you will hear the term non-point source pollution. So some prevention practices for stormwater runoff, and I like to call it polluted stormwater runoff because it makes it a little bit more clearer that it is really a negative impact. Fertilizing appropriately, and we go all the way down our, our um, principles here, using pesticides responsibly. You want to pick up after your pet. And if you observe somebody, your neighbor maybe, or somebody walking your dog and uh, he or she is doing his thing in your front yard, that you say, do you have a bag with you? Could you pick it up? And be kind, be nice, don't, don't be aggressive. I mean, people might get offensive if you attack them, but um, you want to say, if you don't have a bag, I'd be glad to give you one, but please pick up. That's so important. Recycle yard trimmings, leaves and clippings. We talked about that before. Do not litter. If you drop something, pick it up. Collect rainwater in rain barrels or cisterns. Create rain gardens in swales and incorporate pervious surfaces. And just to let you know, um, if you're not familiar with the term pervious or impervious, a pervious surface is something where the water can filter through, such as uh, pavers that are set in sand or um, crushed shells uh, would be a, surf a, a pervious surface. Then um, a mulch pathway is, of course, pervious. Anything impervious would be concrete, a concrete driveway. This is when the water would run off and could not filter back into the ground. So pervious surfaces are really beneficial for getting the water um, back and letting the water draining back into the groundwater. Step number eight, manage yard pests responsibly. So we have lots of bugs in Florida. They like it here, the climate, like we do, right? 
So less than 1% of all insects are pests. And pests is considered anything that would harm your landscape, harm your, your vegetable garden, harm whatever. It's something that is negative to the environment. This is less, this is 99, this is, not, this is less than 1%. That's what I'm saying. So 99% of insects are beneficial insects. So usually if you don't interfere, the beneficial insects, they take care of the, of the bad guys. So that is something that many people are not aware of. And then you look at some of these insects, and you think, you know, they are looking so nasty. Look at this one in the center here. That is a lady beetle larvae. And first you think, oh my goodness, this is a nasty look, little guy. I gotta get rid of him. Think first. That might help you getting rid of aphids. Like the lady beetle, it feeds on aphids. So when you think about pesticides, think about using them only sparingly and as needed because incorrect use of pesticides and too, too much of it can not only harm the little critter that you're trying to, to eliminate, it can also harm people, pets, and beneficial organisms that we so, so dearly need and like to see in our yards. And when I talk about insects, I also want to mention that birds need insects to feed on. Other critters need insects to feed on. So if we, if we kill everything, everything that we don't like or looks a little funny to us or strange, we are really harming beneficial insects and organisms. So here are some tips. Before you go out there and think you've got to have a regular spraying going on from a landscape company or a pest control operator, you want to check your plants regularly by scouting. You want to look into changes. Did anything change? Did leaves curl up? Did you have holes in the leaves? Anything happening in your landscape? And detect it early. It's called integrated pest management, IPM. The first step to that is scouting. The next step is that if you cannot get rid of it, if it's just persistent, you want to use a non-chemical approach first. Non-chemical approaches would be that you use water, you just use your hose and hose the, the critters off your landscape, off your landscape plant. Then you could start and in looking into, if that doesn't work, using environmentally friendly pesticides that could be soaps, that could be horticultural oils, anything that is not harsh to the environment. And you would only use it at the affected areas and a little bit beyond maybe, but not blanket-like. And um, routine applications and preventative applications of pesticides is also not recommended. Preventative applications are most of the time not effective. Let's say you would spray right now for chinch bugs. Chinch bugs are not present in the landscape this time of the year, so you would waste your time and money and you would contribute to pollution. There are other um, examples for that. Um, if you're not sure what it is, you really want to contact the county extension office and you can send in a picture. The office is currently not open for the pub to the public, but you can send a picture. You can call us and they can help you with identifying the issue and the pests and they can help you and um, give you advice how to go about it, what to do about it. Sometimes uh, a pest could be not a bug, it could be a fungus, it could be another situation where you think you know what it is and you are doing something that is um, improper to the landscape and not really helping the, the issue. You also want to only treat affected areas rather than spraying your entire lawn or yard. If you do have a problem in the lawn, you want to again get it identified. It could be take all root rot, it could be a fungus, it could be a bug. It depends on the time of the year, it depends on the type of turf you have, and it also depends on your landscape management practices. Overwatering is a good example for problems that you could create anything like that, and then maybe using too much of fertilizer could create a problem. Anything like this, you could have all kinds of situations that you want to get identified before you take action. If you do have a spot in your yard, like you see on the bottom picture in the front lawn or the lawn at, at all, you don't want to do the whole yard. You want to do just the area that's affected that needs to be treated and then go a little bit beyond, a few feet beyond that. Don't wait until it gets out of hand. This is why the IPM, the scouting, part of the IPM scouting comes into play. 
you want to detect something early enough so that you don't have to spray a large area of the whole yard. You want to really catch it early and treat it early. Principle number nine, protect the waterfront. It's our last principle and again it's about water. We all are, if you look at it, in Pinellas County, we are all waterfront property owners. We are peninsula, we live might be not right at the water, but we live close to the water, all of us. So if you do live in a community or you live anywhere close to a body of water, it could be a retention pond, it could be a lake, it could be the intracoastal, plant a border of low maintenance, maintenance plants between your lawn and shoreline to absorb nutrients and provide habitat. You also been, uh, can contribute to erosion control by planting these plants. And this is, I mean, many good reasons to do that, but look again at the providing habitat. This is another good reason. Plant nat native aquatic vegetation. We always recommend along a body of water to use native plants, aquatic and non-aquatic. So look into native plants and there are really great choices out there. You move, you also want to remove invasive exotic plants such as torpedo grass, anything that what else is growing right at the water um, and remove it. If you need chemicals, you've got to hire somebody who has the license to do that. You don't want to just spray something into water. There are um, people who are, go through training and they have licenses to do that. So if you don't know what it is, don't spray anything if you cannot remove it mechanically. You want to protect the native shoreline. So if you have already native plants there, you want to protect them. So if you have a landscape company who is not familiar with these shoreline plantings, they need to be educated and informed that they don't touch them and don't remove them or don't weed back them or mow them, whatever. So this is, has to do with sh protecting the shoreline. Establishing a 10 to 20 foot no chemical zone along shoreline. This is also for protecting the water that the, um, whatever runs down from the surrounding landscape does not run as heavily into the body of water. And with that, Conclusion, by adopting the principles I was talking about, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Principles, homeowners, communities, and professionals alike can save water and money. It will help to protect our precious resources and it will contribute to a better, healthier environment, not only for us, but also for generations to come. And with that, let me see, it's nine, it's almost, yep, it's time, ready, good. All right, so um, if you have any questions, Sheridan, let me know. Yes, so we do have some really excellent questions. So I am going to switch real quickly. There we go. So um, we have really good questions. I feel like I planted the audience members because they uh, <laughs> were very on point with their questions. So one of the ones I want to start with is I've been asked this uh, by another resident this week. So it's perfect timing because two people are asking us. Um, a lot of people are concerned about using oak leaves as mulch or in compost because they've heard that they're very acidic and they're wondering if oak leaves should only be used for acid loving plants like azaleas or gardenias. Okay, great question. We have extremely alkaline soils. Before we get into the problem of having acidic soil, that would take, I mean, piles and tons of, of, of um, oak leaves. Don't even worry about that. They decompose, you've got to do it again next year, have another load of oak leaves. We'll never have too much of a high pH. You'll get to a healthy pH, maybe. You'll get to, if you really keep doing it over the years, loading up leaves, you might get, if you're really lucky, to 6.5 pH, which is excellent. This is the most favorite pH that most plants have. Between 5.5 and 6.5 is the ideal pH for most plants. Don't worry about it. You won't get to the point where you have too much um, acidity in your soils. Awesome. So on the topic of soil pH, um, Ed is asking, how does one check their own soils? How do we check the pH of our soils? Okay, there are several ways to do that. And I can share with Sheridan um, a, a form that is from, the, from your FIFAS. They test the soil in Gainesville in their lab. It's $3 for the pH plus shipping. And um, that would be something that is most reliable. And I think it's a really reasonable price to do that. 
They are, uh, on the form, it gives you exact instructions how to go about it. So you don't ship wet soil. You might want to take a few samples throughout the yard and mix it so that you get an average. But I I'd be glad to share this with Sheridan so that she can um, forward this to you. The other way is to get a, a kit, which is not as reliable. You can buy them in, in nurseries or in maybe in big box stores. You can get them there. Uh, not as reliable, but if you don't have anything else, okay. And then some local nurseries, they also, some of them also test um, um, pH. So these are the three options that you have. So we will have on our Clearwater Sustainability School, we'll have a recording of this webinar and then additional resources. And I'll make sure to uh, link to that website and also provide the soil testing form. I just checked too, it's really easy. Even if you just look up UF IFAS soil testing pH, the form automatically pops up. So you're mm -hmm. welcome to also give it a yep. call as well. They make it easy for you. So at the extension office, just to let you know, we are not testing soil pH anymore in Pinellas County. That's about, must be 12 years ago or so that we stopped doing that. If you are from another county, I don't know if everybody is from this area here, but um, Hillsborough County, they still do test it, but not here in Pinellas. Okay. And um, when it comes to identifying invasive plants, is there a website or a resource that people can go to that lists them? Yes, I will email or share this with you, Sheridan. There's the IFAS assessment list and there's the FLEPSI list. The FLEPSI list is the Florida uh, oh, Exotic Pest Plant Council, Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, and they renew their list every two years. So the last one was updated in 2019. There are no pictures, but you have um, the common name and the um, scientific name. So you can look them up then and see what the picture looks like. And you have IFAS assessment. They do have the pictures with it. It's a little different, uh, differently organized. So I like both to use both. I will also share this with you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so Chris is asking, would lake water contain enough nutrients to avoid fertilization? Can you repeat the question for me? Yes. So if you are using lake water, is that enough? Would that contain enough nutrients that you would not need to fertilize your plants? Okay. I have to get more detail on what's considered lake. Is it a mm -hmm. pond or is it a lake, a true lake? Or is it a pond? A True. Region? And you're probably wondering what plants are you trying to fertilize? Because that might yes. have different requirements as well. Exactly. So, but very general. If you do live close to a retention pond, a per permanent pool, and the water is surrounded by landscape, yes, this will be nutrient rich. And this is why you see the algae sometimes or very often floating on top of these ponds because the nutrients running down from fertilizers. So yes, if you pump irrigation water out of a pond, and again, it depends a little bit on where it's at, how it's maintained around it, it will most likely contain nutrients. So yes, you will have already liquid fertilizer that goes onto your plants. That's correct. Perfect. Um, you spoke uh, a bunch about rain barrels and rainwater harvesting. Uh, mm -hmm. which is awesome. And Gabrielle is wondering, can rainwater be used safely in a vegetable garden? That is a fantastic question. And here are two opinions. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, there's research done from universities, not from UF. UF says right now, don't use it on any vegetables. It used to be that we can use it on vegetables as long as you don't put it on the edible part. If you put it, if you water the plant on the roots or if you peel the fruit or the vegetable. Now, there are different opinions out there. I'm very much torn between, okay, if I do have a rain barrel, I want to use it on my veggies. So my advice would be use it wisely. Don't use it on something you are eating directly. But if you use it on the root system, and if you don't, if you, if you peel the plant or the, 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 the veggie or the fruit, then I would say yes. If you want to be super, super, super careful, you don't want to use it at all. So it really is a bit of a common sense question and response here. But um, my common sense is if I have a rain barrel, I want to use it on my veggies. That's me. Mm -hmm. 
So we have just a request into, we put a request to UF because we get the question all the time. We are teaching rainwater harvesting classes. We are teaching veggie classes, veggie gardening classes. So we asked UF saying, where is the research? We need to know a definite response or definite research here on yay or nay. So this is my wishy-washy answer for today. I don't I have like that. <laughs> wishy-washy. Um, <laughs> So we do have uh, another great question. So when it comes to trying to prevent erosion, what plants or shrubs or trees might be the best to protect and prevent erosion? That's a really great question. It depends a little bit on the situation. However, if you can plant trees and you don't get in trouble with blocking the view for some homeowners, who bought into a waterfront view. I have that a lot, that people say, it cannot be high, it cannot be tall. If you can do plant trees, anything that likes water, if, if it's a permanent pool, let's say you do have, are you talking about a lake here? Or are we talking a general landscape if erosion? I wasn't quite clear on that. This is a different, different person, so I'm thinking it's just a general landscape. General? Okay. So in a general landscape, it really depends how much room you have, how much, um, what you like and how bad the erosion is. For a quick fix, I would say plant a ground cover, like the sunshine mimosa. That's a great plant for erosion control. If you have full sun, it depends again on the situation. If you do have room, plant a tree, plant maybe more than a tree. Maybe you have room for a big one, maybe you have room for a medium size, maybe for a small, a few small trees. Plant trees, always start with trees. Then you might wanna look into um, some shrubs, and then if you really want to go into, um, again, a quick fix, grasses have fibrous roots and they are excellent erosion control plants. So anything ornamental grasses such as muley grass, fecahedry grass, gamma grass, so I'm talking native grasses here, um, that would be excellent for, for erosion control. Awesome. Um, so I have a resident who, um, Outside her front door, there is a large sheltered area where she has some pothos, but it has absolutely basically no sun. And she's asking for recommendations on, so for an area that's really shaded, what kind of plants might we be able to plant there? I mean, am I talking full shade or a little bit of morning sun or full, she, full shade? She's saying full shade, like okay. no sun. So let me just um, give you a little bit of input here on full shade would be considered four hours and less. So if you have partial between four and, and six hours, and six hours plus would be considered full sun. So if it's really less than three hours, yes, it would be shade. However, um, again, that is something that is really um, remains to be seen. Depends on the space you have, mm -hmm. depends on the, on the, on the, do you wanna go in containers? Do you wanna put it in the ground? What do you like? There are so many things that I cannot really say anything to because it really depends on what the situation is. Yeah. So, but if you are interested, we are teaching a design class. Uh, it's a tri-county design class. I can send all the dates to you also, Sheridan. And that is in March. Let me check here. Um, it's a combination of, um, we talk about plant selection, we talk about design as well as the nine principles very briefly. Um, that's March 18th. We are teaching okay. a tri-county class. It's a Thursday from 10 to 12. Okay, awesome. And I know too, and it depends on what kind of plants you're hoping for, but the Florida Native Plant Society also has a ton of resources online. And you could even, they have this really cool tool where you can say like where your property is, what county, what zone. Mm -hmm. And if it's getting really full shade, then you hit that and it gives you different native plants that it thinks would do well there too. Right, so what you can Google or put in the search engine is um, Florida Native Plant Society. And there's great information right there. And then you can go into your local chapter and see what they are up to, Perfect. Pinellas County. Uh, and then there is F-A-N-N, -N, FAN, Florida Association of Native Nurseries. If you Google that or put that in the search engine, you get great information from that website as well. Perfect. And I have, we're not going to be able to get to everyone's questions, but I have, uh, Cindy is asking where we can purchase Florida native plants. I have three of the nurseries if you want, if you want to recommend them, Doris, but I know of a few of them too. 
Yeah, I cannot really recommend anybody. I'm not supposed to do that, but there are not many native nurseries in Pinellas County. Um, again, go to the FANN website, FAN, Florida Association of Native Nurseries. They have them all listed per county. Perfect. And then I think the last question that we'll be able to get to tonight, someone, oh, Janet is wondering, um, can she schedule an appointment with someone from IFAS or the county to check her yard and get it certified as Florida friendly? Yes, you can call me. Awesome. What's your, what's your work phone number? 727-582-2422. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you letting us quiz you with all those perfect questions. It was um, great. Your presentation was fantastic. And then your ability to answer that variety of questions on the spot is so impressive. Thank you, Sheridan. It was, a, it was really fun to teach this class. And um, I'm glad we had a good group. And I'm happy about all these great questions. So wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Good. So I want to thank you, Doris, and everyone who's attending. Um, again, this conference is the last in a four-part series. To learn more about our past webinars um, or to find their recordings in addition to a recording of this webinar, please visit myclearwater.com slash bbn. We appreciate your comments, which you can send to me at my email on the screen, which is sheridan.boyle at myclearwater.com. Um, please send me any questions um, and, and we'd always welcome feedback on what you thought of our webinar series. And with that, I just wanna thank Doris one more time. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you, Sheridan. Bye-bye everybody.